Hey everyone, welcome to my shop. Thanks for joining me for another patron Q&A where I answer questions submitted by our Patreon supporters. Now if you'd like to support our efforts and have your questions answered right here on the channel, please consider joining our Patreon community. We'll have more information on how you can go about doing so at the end of the video. Right now though, let's get into today's questions. So today's first question comes from Lawrence. And Lawrence wants to see a demonstration of draw boring a mortise and tenon. And I just so happen to have a project that I'm working on here that's going to have draw board mortise and tenons. So let me go ahead and disassemble this and I'll show you on one of these uh, mortise and tenons how we go about doing the draw board. All right, so what I have here is I've got my, my stretcher mortised into my leg. And this leg still needs to be turned. Um, so I'm not going to. Uh, actually assemble this yet, but I can show you how to do the draw bore. So what I've done is, is I've kind of drawn how this mortise is uh, made in this leg. I'm going to take the tendon out for now. Okay, so so that's the the mortise. That's a visual of the mortise. Uh, you can see there. And what I've done is I've gone ahead and marked out the exact center of the mortise and that's where I want to drill my draw bore hole. I want to try and leave the maximum amount of strength possible. So I've gone and marked for a hole here and I'm going to go ahead and bore that and in this case I'm just going to bore it with a quarter inch bit because I have a fairly small tenon so we're just gonna we're gonna be pegging this with a quarter inch peg. So I'm gonna bore completely through the face of the mortise. And actually into the other side of the leg block. Okay, so you can see here I've cleared out uh, most of the chips, and you can see that. Here's the bit, and I've actually bored completely through and down into this part of the leg block because once when we assemble this, we want that peg to go all the way down, uh, all the way through the tenon and all the way into the opposite side of the mortise. So now that I have the mortise bored all the way through, it's time to go ahead and mark the tenon. So we're going to put the tenon back in and we want to seat it as far as we can. And I'm going to use the bit that I used to bore the hole to mark the tenon, and that's going to ensure the lead screw will mark the hole, mark the spot in the, uh, in the tenon where the hole in the mortise is. So now, what you can see is that the lead screw marked us a spot right there. Now, in order to have a peg draw this joint up tighter, instead of drilling the hole there where the lead screw marked, I'm going to move that hole about a sixteenth of an inch closer to the shoulder and mark it with an awl. So now, I can fill that in with some pencil there for you to see. Here was our original mark where the auger lead screw marked. Here's the mark where I'm actually going to drill through the tenon, offset about a sixteenth of an inch closer to the shoulder. So now what you can see, when that resulting joint is assembled, if you look inside the hole, the hole in the tenon and the hole in the mortise don't line up. That's so that when we draw, draw, drive in the draw bar peg, it'll pull that joint nice and tight. To make the draw bar peg, I take a piece of quarter inch oak dowel or you can shave a peg. Take your uh, sloyd knife or your pocket knife, taper the leading edge so that when you drive that peg home, uh, it has a point to guide itself into 
the offset holes. Then, when you assemble that joint, the peg going through the offset holes pulls the shoulder line nice and tightly together. So our next question comes from Jay, and Jay wants to know about work holding for small work pieces when you're planing. Um, pieces such as this one by one by eight inch piece of hickory. Um, Jay says, could you show us how to plane a small hardwood piece? Uh, he says one by one by eight inch soft maple is what I'm using. Um, I know this sounds basic, but I've been learning how to flatten square much bigger pieces in yellow pine while making a workbench, and I realized that getting some insight in how to hold smaller pieces for marking and planing, um, pieces necessary for things like shooting boards and bench hooks would be helpful because it seems like a slightly different skill set. To go along with this question, which plane would you use? Um, or number four, block planes, skew block, other tool. And are there special jigs that you would use to hold small pieces, or will using the leg vise or tail vise uh, on the bench work? So, let's take a look at some options for holding small work pieces. So, in terms of plane choices, um, you have plenty. You know, there, there's really no right or wrong answer. Um, a block plane would certainly work, as would a number four sized smoother or smaller smoother. Even a jack plane would probably work for a piece about this size. My general rule of thumb is that I try not to use a plane that's too much longer than the length of the piece that I'm planing. Um, so in this case, I would probably opt for the smooth plane, because for me, um, I, I prefer to use bench planes over block planes. Uh, I feel like I have more control with them. Um, but I. If I didn't have a number four, I certainly wouldn't hesitate to use a number five or jack plane size on something this big. Um, but again, block plane will certainly work just as well. It really comes down to what's gonna be more comfortable for you. So I'd say try, try them all and see what you feel like you have more control with. For actually doing the work of planing, uh, there are lots of different options. If you have a planing stop, that will certainly work just fine. Planing stops typically take a little bit more practice to get used to using them, but on small pieces you usually don't have to worry about the piece moving around too much or, or spinning off the side of the planing stop because you can usually center that work piece right in the middle of the planing stop so you're pushing right through the middle um, of the planing stop itself. Um, even if you don't have a tooth stop like this one, just the wooden stop will work just fine. Or you could even put a couple finish nails in the face of your wooden stop and turn it into a tooth stop. Of course, you could also use the bench vise. Something like this that's flush with the bench top. I'm gonna keep those pieces just up over, over top of the bench. Uh, and it's going to work, again, just fine. If you have a tail vise, you could certainly use it. But for small pieces like this, um, I typically uh, don't find that it's necessary. Now, you mentioned making a bench hook. So, obviously, if you don't yet have a bench hook, one of those previous examples of the planing stop or the bench vise is going to be your best bet. But if you already have a bench hook, Using the bench hook is another great way to, uh, to hold your work small pieces while planing, as long as those pieces are taller than the fence on your bench hook. And also keep in mind that if your bench hook has nails or fasteners in it, uh, you're probably not going to want to plane across there. So I'll just flip mine over and use the side that's just glue. A great method for holding really thin stock, if it's too thin for even your planing stop um, or your, your bench vise or a bench hook is to use double stick tape. Um, and I'll demonstrate the use of this as I answer the next question. So our last question for today comes from Mike. Mike has a question about making veneer. Since I'm interested in the process of making veneer, I enjoy making shaker oval boxes which require the veneer to be soaked in hot water and bent around a form. 
Variations in thickness of the veneer increase the probability of breakage, so achieving a consistent thickness is important. Typical size of veneer before bending is 3 32nds of an inch thick by 30 inches long by 3 inches wide. Um, I love shaker oval boxes and um, ironically I've never built one yet, um, but they are high on my list of things to build for the new cabin uh, once we get in there. But I have made veneer, I have sawn my own veneer, um, and it is a certainly a fun thing to do. For something as small as shaker over oval box sides veneer, um, you really don't need much more than a standard rip saw. Three to four inch wide veneer um, is actually most easily sawn with just a standard handsaw. Um, You'll hear a lot of talk about frame saws, um, and I'll talk about those in a future video. Frame saws really excel when you need to saw wide veneer, stuff that's wider than say seven to eight inches. For anything up to six, seven inches, this is really gonna be your best choice. It's gonna be the easiest to control, um, and it's going to just in general be the easiest to use for those narrow boards, sawing veneer in those narrow boards. Once you get above about seven or eight inches, then you may want to start looking at a larger saw like, like a frame saw um, that has become kind of popular for sawing veneer. But really, the frame saw is overkill for anything smaller than about six or seven inches. So how I start when I'm making veneer is to start by prepping one face of your thicker board. You want this face to be flat, you want it to be smooth, you want it to be pretty much ready to go. Then I'm going to take my marking gauge and I'm going to scribe a line on all four sides, all the way around. I've already done that on this board. Um, for a 3 seconds inch veneer, I'm going to scribe that line a fat eighth of an inch. So, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, what an eighth of an inch is 4 30 seconds. So maybe 4 30 seconds, maybe 5 30 seconds, you know, maybe 9 64 it's whatever. I'm not really measuring it. Um, a fat eighth of an inch, really, to, to finish out at about 3 30 seconds of an inch thick. The trick to making veneer by hand is how you saw. I saw in my, I, I'm going to saw this in my bench vise. And when I do this, I work my way around the board starting at a corner. So I want to start here and you know what? Let's give you a better view of this. So I want to keep my saw on the waist side of the line. And I'm going to slowly work my way down this edge and across this end here. And flattening that board out a little bit is going to help you get straight down this edge. Now I'm working in pine, which believe it or not is actually harder to do than um, your, your harder woods in terms of making veneer because it's so soft, this saw has a tendency to wander a bit more. In harder woods, it's actually a little easier to, to keep straight. And I'm going to constantly readjust. Now, it's not a fast process, so don't think that you're going to sit here and, and saw this, um, you know, in in a minute or two. It's probably going to take you 10 or 15 minutes. But what's important here is that your saw is sharp, and that you take your time. The faster you try to saw the more chance you're going to have of getting thrown off your line. And I'm leaving the full pencil line. You probably saw that from the, the last view when before I flipped the board around. Okay, so I just connected those across the top there. Now I'm going to start to work down this edge. And again, I'm going to readjust my board frequently and I'm leaving the entire pencil line. What I did was I put a line with the marking gauge and then I filled it in with a pencil line so it's easy to see. 
constantly readjusting. And the reason for that is I want to I want to continue these curves down. But the long curves that I start are going to help to guide the saw as you go around. Again, turn the, turn the board. This also allows you to make corrections. By turning the board around, you can keep track on whether or not you're getting off, your kerf is getting off on the other side. So as you make progress down the board, keep turning it so that you can continue to adjust that cut. Now as you get close to the end, you have a choice. If you start with a board that's longer than you need, you can just go ahead and cross cut your veneer off. Otherwise, if you want to use the entire board, flip the board over and restart your cut from the other end. Okay, and there's your rough sawn veneer. Now when it comes to planing the veneer, you can certainly use a planing stop similar to what we did for the other small pieces. If you have a tooth planing stop like this, it's going to make a, a it's going to help a little, you know, to keep things from sliding around. The problem is when your veneer when, or your boards start to get this thin, um, you begin to uh, start to to take the chance of these teeth starting to split the end of this out. And if you've got a, a, a burl or something like that, um, you could really just break the edge of this apart, uh, force it into the planing stop, uh, end up with your plane catching the, you know, your plane blade catching the top of the, um, of the planing stop. So there's actually a better way. And, and the other problem here is because this is so flexible, as you're planing, you could be lifting or buckling this board. You can see how easy this is to bend this board. Um, you could buckle this as you're planing. So there's actually a better way. So one of my favorite little tricks for really thin stock like this is double stick tape. Um, it's a great little, uh, great little trick to hold things down and it really keeps the board um, stable and steady. You've got access to both ends and you don't have to worry about the board buckling during planing because it's going to be supported over its whole length. So if you put a little double stick tape uh, and I'm just using a, a carpet tape, a double stick carpeting tape, put it on the smooth side then go ahead and just double stick tape it right down to your workbench. Then you can plane this pretty aggressively. Now you don't have to worry about hitting a planing stop with your blade. You don't have to worry about the stock buckling. And you don't have to worry about planing to this too thin to the point where it um, can't be held by a planing stop, which is always a risk when you're starting to plane really thin stuff. Now, once you're done planing this, this is going to be quite fragile, so you don't want to just go peel this up. Get a thin bladed knife and just slide it, work it under. Get it between the, uh, the workbench and the tape, or between the veneer and the tape, and slowly work that piece free from the bench so that you don't split it.
And if you're working with small veneer or fragile veneer, um, you may want to, or, or important veneer, now I'm being a little rough here because this is just a demonstration, you may want to use less tape. Just put a few pieces down. So you can see I broke that there because I'm being a little bit rough with it. But if you take your time and you're careful, um, it'll come up without, uh, without breaking. And again, if you use, a, use a, a little bit less tape. But again, this is pine and, uh, and I was being a little bit, a little bit rough with it because this is just a, a demonstration. But you can see, uh, I've got some, some pretty thin stock here. Now I don't usually measure wood with a caliper, but let's see what we've got. So at this end, I'm down to 4,000 point, 0 0.04 inches. So four hundredths of an inch. That is pretty small, uh, 0.04 inches. Now, again, I also was not being very um, consistent and Mike did mention about needing, you know, fairly consistent thickness for, for bending. Well, in that case, if you get yourself just a, uh, an outside caliper like this, set it to the dimension that you need. You can run it, you know, let's say that I needed something that was about 330 seconds, so I can set this to roughly 330 seconds and run it over my board. If I find a, an area where it sticks, I know I'm a little too thick there. So I can put it back down on the, on the tape, maybe use a card scraper in that area or hand plane that area a little bit more until my caliper will read everywhere I need to be a good consistent thickness. Um, in fact, this is a very similar method to what uh, classical violin makers used to measure the thickness of, uh, of the top boards, of the sound boards of violins. So there you go. That's how I make veneer. Thanks for watching everyone. If you like this video and would like to see more videos like it, please take a minute to click that thumbs up icon, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment below. If you'd like to submit your own questions to be answered here in a future video, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash brfinewoodworking for all the details. Our patrons help us to continue to create quality content like these videos and our bi-weekly audio podcast without subjecting you to annoying sponsorship ads. And as a Patreon supporter, you can submit your own questions to be answered in a future video right here on the channel. So thanks again for watching, and until next time, stay sharp.